in this video presentation, I'll give you nine tips, concepts or ideas you can use so you can fall in love with summer landscape photography or, well, at least get the most out of the summer season. Summer is not known to be a favorite season for the average landscape photographer. That title usually goes to autumn or winter, but summer can deliver some absolutely stunning photos. Summer can certainly be a hard and especially impractical season to photograph, but overcoming these obstacles is very well worth it. And the first tip might actually be a little bit weird, because if you really struggle with summer landscape photography, the best thing you can do is actually just to avoid everything that shows that it is the season or that the photo depends on the season. So there's no trees and no foliage in your photo. Maybe just blank blue skies and in that way you really don't reveal what season it is. You still want to take a photo of something that's still important, but avoid subjects that depends on the season. And that could be cityscapes as an example. Here there's not really anything that reveals what kind of season this is. And you can photograph lighthouses, historic monuments such as stone circles, dolmens, even pyramids. In this example here, you again can't really see what season it is. So if you really do struggle with a specific season and photograph a specific season, basically just avoid trying to show it in your photos. So the second tip is to, of course, use what's present in the season, and that is flowers. So spring bloom happens in the end of spring and early summer. It depends a little bit on where you are on earth and, and how the weather has been throughout spring season. This year here in 2021, we have had a very late spring bloom. So we've had a lot of flowers from the usual spring bloom into June. So think about to have any kind of local flowers like I have wild garlic and I know a lot of England has wild garlic too. England also has bluebells. We don't have really a lot of bluebells here in Denmark. So think about what is present in your local area that you can photograph and use. In June there's of course the puppies all around and in this example here I've combined it with a dolmen, a historical monument. In Iceland they have a lot of lupins all over the place. It's absolutely gorgeous. So if you ever make it to Iceland Definitely go to Iceland in June to photograph all these lupins. And then there's, of course, the infamous, I think by now, lavenders down in France. So generally just think about anything special in your local area that you can use in your summer photography. Most of spring bloom has ended when July hits, but the good thing about July is that the grass is just green. So in this photo here from the Faroe Islands, the grass is like really, really green, but it's the same in Iceland or Denmark or anywhere else, Switzerland for that matter. The grass is just green and it gives this beautiful, calm, optimistic summer vibe. So obviously use the grass to your advantage. And then when we hit August, most of the European countries have heather that you of course can include in your photos. Third tip is to go macro, zoom into the intimate details. You don't need a macro lens to do it. In this case here, I've just used a long lens. It's a 100 to 400 millimeter. You can also play around with a shallow depth of field. Either you can use your long lens and open up the aperture as much as possible, or you can use a dedicated lens where you can have a very open aperture, as in this example here, where I used a 135 millimeter f2 lens. If you go into a forest and you just have an area of 10 square meters, then you will be surprised by how many options for interesting photos that you can usually get when you go into the intimate details. The fourth tip is, of course, to benefit from all the rural landscapes. We are landscape photographers, so we don't necessarily only need to photograph landscapes that are untouched by human beings, even though I know that myself included, a lot of landscape photographers prefer that. But we have a lot of rural landscapes, and most of us probably live close to a rural landscape unless we live straight in the city. And there are many kinds of rural landscapes. We have the classic canola fields in May and June, 
and then we also have like barley and rye and wheat in May and June and July that you can include in your photos in different kinds of weather. And the further we get into summer season, the color of the different kinds of wheat change. And as per always, I personally try to include some kind of subject, as in this example here, we have the lighthouse and the clouds in the background, and then the rural landscape becomes the secondary subject. And here are three more examples. So we have a classic canola field with a lone tree. We have a rye field where I also photographed this beautiful, beautiful sun halo. And then there's basically just a field full of grass and some uh, trees standing there. And I've used the drone to photograph that one. And then of course, later in summer, it is harvest season. And again, it's only your imagination that sets the limits for what you can get. In this case here, I've used a drone in both photos, one with a harvester to photograph the lines, and then the other one here in black and white, where I've also just shot almost straight down to capture the lines in the field. If you so far enjoy this video, I would highly appreciate a like. And when you're down there, you can also leave a comment. I almost don't care whatever you write. What did you have for breakfast? Anything. All this engagement on my video does help push it out to even more people. So I highly appreciate likes and comments. Tip five or idea five is to go into forests and photograph them. And when you're photographing forests during summer, I personally find that backlighting is the secret. It's not really a secret, <laughs> but it is the top tip I can give you to really get interesting photos in a summer forest. I also find that usually I benefit the most if the sun is no further up than 30 degrees above the horizon. It has something to do with the strength of the sunlight and how it falls in through the canopy. And in this case here, the sun was probably about like 25 degrees above the horizon. Then, as I always talk about when I talk about forest photography, is that fog plays a massive role and a massive difference to your photos. It gives so much atmosphere. And of course, the later you get in summer, that being August, uh, you have a bigger chance of fog. It can happen in June and July, no doubt about that. In the case here on the left, that was in basically in the middle of July, where I had to get up very early to get this photo here. And the other one is from the start of August, where I also got like absolutely gorgeous, foggy and atmospheric conditions. So the sixth tip or idea is to seek out harsh weather, moody clouds, rain showers, storms and so forth. Thunderstorms usually happen also during summer, whether it is in the Midwest US or it happens in Europe, Southern Europe, we do see periods where we get a lot of really, really harsh weather. And that can, of course, create some absolutely interesting and beautiful photos. A good rain shower is also highly beneficial if you live in a mountainous area, in this case here, the Faroe Islands, because it fills up all the waterfalls. So you get a lot more dynamic in your photo. After all, a waterfall with water is more interesting than one without. Now that I go through all these photos, you may wonder about the composition. So if you want to learn even more about composition and landscape photography, you can check out my two ebooks. There are links down in the comments for them. They are designed to be very easy to understand. They are full of examples, very minimal text. So I can actually get the ideas across as fast as possible. If you're in doubt about whether these ebooks are something for you, you can download the two free light versions also down in the comments and check those out first. There is nothing that screams summer more than beautiful golden hour light, and it almost doesn't matter where on earth you are. In these two examples here, one from Denmark and another one here from Alsace in France. And both photos have that in common, that it is back lighting. So you can see how the light really interacts with the different kinds of foliage that is present in the photos. Now, as I started out by saying in the beginning of this video, summers can be super impractical. And that is especially around golden hour, because you have to get up very, very early in the mornings to capture the sunrises. In this particular case here, 
it is photographed at 6.15 a.m. So I've been up like at the very least an hour before that because I have to drive to the place. In this case here, 5.22 a.m. But that is just what it takes to get those beautiful atmospheric conditions during summer. And sometimes you're just lucky. This photo here was taken at 9.24 a.m. It was in August, but I have very, very strong atmospheric conditions all the way up to like 10 a.m. ish. And in the other end, at sunset, you have to go to bed very, very late. So this photo here is taken at 9.24 p.m. and as you can see the sun is just setting and lighting up all these clouds from behind. Absolutely beautiful. But yes, it is annoying that you have to go out after dinner photographing and then you come home and then you go to bed. So if you are very far north up in Iceland or northern Norway, then you may as well just go for an all-nighter. <laughs> Because sunset in this particular case here is 11.50 p.m. And then the sun rises a couple of hours later. The sun is only going down beneath the horizon. So if you're way far north, definitely just go for an all-nighter. And of course, the opposite is true. Two earlier sunsets and later sunrises, the further south you go. In this particular case here, Gran Canaria, 8.49 p.m. So the eighth tip and idea is to photograph during night. Night is always interesting to photograph, no matter if it's summer, autumn or winter. But summer is great for Milky Way photography if you are far enough south where it actually gets dark enough for you to actually be able to see it. In this case here, beautiful Milky Way arch I photographed in Gran Canaria. If you're up in the latitudes where I live in Denmark, we have what we call the bright nights, where we have twilight from sunset to sunrise. That means that the sun does not go lower than 18 degrees below the horizon. So we always have this twilight glow. And during summer, we get this absolutely stunning phenomenon called noctilucent clouds, also known as NLCs. In this case here, I photographed this last summer. You can see Comet Neovice up here, but it is the noctilucent clouds that really stands out in this photo here. I actually have an upcoming video about noctilucent clouds where I've collected material for the past couple of summers. Hopefully it will be done this summer. Just need a photo or two more for it to be complete. So a great tip when you're photographing noctilucent clouds is to use a longer focal length so that you actually fill the frame with these beautiful tendrilic clouds. And the later into the season we get, late July and August, it is again dark enough for you to be able to see the Milky Way and then you can of course go out and photograph the Milky Way. And as I mentioned earlier, the further north you go, you may actually just pull an all-nighter and photograph all night long, which is what I did in this particular case here, photographing Hauifoss in Iceland at sunset on the left photo. And then I had beautiful clouds all night, all the way through sunrise. And there's no doubt about it, that I also apply a lot of editing to my photos. So if you want to learn how I edit my photos, there's also a link to my huge Photoshop for landscape photographers course down in the comments. I've designed it for both beginners and for advanced users, where I share all the tips and tricks and techniques I use in Photoshop to get the photos that I really enjoy looking at. There's also a discount code for it, so yeah, check it out. The sixth tip idea is basically how to deal with blue or clear skies during summer. I really like to use the blues as a kind of color contrast, especially when I photograph the canola fields. Super simple photos, clear blue sky, which is beneficial in this example here. The completely yellow fields and then a green tree right there in the middle. And it's not like these two photos are taken at a special time of day. I think it's just like more or less in the middle of the day I took these two photos and they work out great. You can also go into black and white photography. I'm not personally a big fan of black and white photography, but generally black and white photography works really great with blue skies as you can put in different filters that really darkens down the sky and you get those very high contrast photos and maybe wait for a few wispy clouds here or there there to add a little bit more interest to the sky. You can use a polarizing filter for the effect of 
darkening the blues, cutting out haze, and basically just pull out more saturation in your green foliage in the photo, which is what I did in this particular case here with this lighthouse. And if you're in doubt about how to use a polarizing filter, be sure to check out my video about that. There's a link up in the corner. If you do not know how to deal with the blue skies, you can of course avoid them. You can go into a forest or a canyon area to photograph. Or you can just shoot straight down as I've done in these two examples here. You can also head out to the sea on a very windy day. You can use all the dust and sea spray and all the other stuff that's whirled up from the ground that adds a lot of atmosphere and interest. As you can see in this example here, we get a pretty good idea that it is a very windy day because of how the sand is getting blown over the beach and of course the waves in the background. You can also wait for something of interest to include in your clear sky. It can be birds, clouds, comets during night, rockets or planes, I don't know. You can come up with something uh, yourself. And of course you can wait for the golden hour and avoid including too much of the sky and yeah. You can check out that tip again. So here in the end, do you have any tips that you want to share for great summer landscape photography? I would highly appreciate a like and a subscribe if you enjoyed this video.